Well, good morning. I am so glad that we have God's Word. Today, we're going to be looking again in Exodus. Remember, our, our premise of this whole series is, this is our God. Let's use the, the pages of Exodus to look at the story of God, to learn the depths and understand who God is. And I'll tell you, what a joy that when we look at Exodus, we get to see how God worked with and through Moses. And so I hope that you've been able to keep up with us. If not, I encourage you to look back uh, online and go and look at some of the previous messages. But today I want to kind of start with the question of why? Have you ever shook your fist at God? Maybe you're one of those people who says, why God? Why is this happening? Or, or maybe you just continually say, why me? Why is this here? Or, or why is that happening there? I don't understand. And I remember uh, when I was doing youth ministry, it was a couple years I'd been uh, taking groups of kids up to Portland. We'd go to a worship conference and I remember this particular time we, we headed up, it was, I believe, a Friday night, and we get there, we get camp set up, and we go to, uh, into the Colosseum and have just a great time of worship. And while we were there, man, the Spirit of God was moving, and people were praising God, and it was wonderful. And we came back to camp, and I'm exhausted. It's about midnight, and I crawl into bed. I cannot wait to get to sleep. Everybody's in their rooms, and then I get the phone call, and the woman's uh, the girl's room, one of the rooms, this raw sewage was flowing up from the floor, out of the shower, the drain, and into the room. And it just was a horrible smell. And I thought, why, God? Why? We just had this worship experience, and now we're dealing with raw sewage. This is horrible. This, this is going to detract from what was supposed to happen in the lives of these, these kids we brought. And I wonder in your life, have you ever had those moments where you write the tithe check and put it in the mail and you're just so grateful and worshiping God, and then the car breaks down on the way to work or you get in a car wreck and you think, oh no, now what? Why? I was, I was just praising you. Or, or you were in the middle of deep, intense prayer and, and uh, later that day you find out that a family member's, member is really sick. Or those favorite times where you're singing a praise song with your kids about to drop them off to school and they, they head off to school and everything seems so right. And then the call that there was a disciplinary action and you're called into the school. Our story, we're going to see that unfold today, these moments of why in our life. And, and I first just want to lay the groundwork. A why is not a bad thing. It's not wrong to ask God why. But let me just challenge today that perhaps we need to ask a different question. What? What is it, God, that you're trying to show me today? Or why are you allowing this to happen? Would you help me? But I want to lay a groundwork for today's message also with this truth. We have been unpacking. Uh, we started off week one with Pastor Jason on God is sovereign, meaning he is all-powerful, that he is in control of all things. And two, I taught on compassionate, that God is a God of compassion. He cares for you and for me, and he cares for the Israelites we're reading about. And then we had Pastor Drew with the I am, that great statement when God's name is declared. I am, I have always existed, I always will, I know all things, I am. And finally, last week, Pastor Jason again with God is powerful. And today we're going to need those attributes of God, those truths of God to carry us through today's message because none of those are removed. And yet I believe you're going to see Moses is going to question every one of them. So let's uh, remind ourselves where we left off last week and we'll get into the text. If you want to open up to Exodus chapter 5, that's where we're at. And uh, last week we left off, Moses had been spoken to by God. He had challenged God with his unworthiness. Who am I? Send somebody else, anybody else. But he went and performed the signs. Remember the sign, the, the snake that became a staff, the leprous hand that was healed, the, the blood from the water that, of the Nile that was poured out and it was blood. And those signs were performed for the elders and they believed. And it says in the end of chapter four, they bowed their heads and worshiped. 
Man, here's this, this moment, right? Moses goes from deep worship, trusting that God is working. He saw it happen with his people. And now he's getting ready to go see Pharaoh. Remember Pharaoh. It's a new Pharaoh from when he was in Egypt. He fled from that Pharaoh. That Pharaoh has died. But nonetheless, he's going to enter into the presence of the king of Egypt, Pharaoh. And he's going to declare what God told him to say. And so that's where we're at in chapter five. And so it says, uh, follow with me. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to see Pharaoh. Remember, Aaron is his older brother and God provides Aaron with him. So they went to see Pharaoh. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Talk about a downhill moment. You left worshiping God with the elders, sure that it was going to happen. In fact, you're entering in. I imagine that perhaps Moses and Aaron thought, this is going to be easy. We're going to just waltz right in, proclaim what's going to happen. God's going to prevail, and we're going to exit and just celebrate and go and worship him. But that's not what he said. He says, who is the Lord? I do not know the Lord. Who is this servant slave God of yours? I don't know him. Who is this Yahweh you proclaim? Who is this I am? Or today people might say, who is this Jesus? I don't know him. I don't know who this is. And, and why should I listen to his voice? Why should I let you go? Verse 3 says, then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Uh, the God of the Hebrews, that's what I'm talking about, Pharaoh, remember? A minute ago, I just told you it's the God of Israel. Well, it's the God of the Hebrews, if you don't know who that is. He says, please let us go three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. I'm reading this, and I don't recall ever in the conversations that, that Moses had with God where he said, hey, if you don't get the people to go, then I'm going to bring pestilence on them. I'm going to bring the sword. And so it doesn't say this here, but, but I was reading this this week, and it really struck me that it feels a little bit like what Pharaoh is do, or excuse me, what Moses is doing here is adding to a little bit of what God had said. And it's probably a good idea. Hey, um, Pharaoh, if, if we don't go, then all your slaves are going to get sick and, and perhaps die. Well, you'll be no better off. So you probably should just let us go. But just on a personal note, I was reflecting on the times of my life when I've tried to use God as a leveraging tool. Have you ever found yourself doing that? Maybe, maybe in the family, you've, you've been reading about how God says to children, obey your parents. And so you you use that as a leveraging tool. Well, you know, God does say you better obey, so clean your room. Instead of coaching and, and teaching and understanding the greater depths of why God says the value of obeying is. Or maybe as a wife, you've said to uh, your husband, you know, it does say that you're supposed to die to me like the church. That's what, that's what the word says. Or the husband to the wife, uh, you know, wife, it says you're supposed to, you know, submit to me, do what I say. And all the time we try to use God as a leveraging tool and we miss out on the fuller context of what that word was for, that it was to encourage and to equip and to build us up. But often I think we use God's word to break others down. And I, I feel like this is one of those moments. You know, Pharaoh, God would possibly bring pestilence and the sword on your, on your servants. That could be really bad. Your slaves could get sick or die. And then where would you be? But that's not the influence that moved Pharaoh. Verse 4 says this, But the king of Egypt, Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens? The same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmaster of the people and their foremen, you shall no longer give them straw to make bricks as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past, you shall impose on them. 
by sh- you shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. These slaves, these workers, these Hebrews, they're just lazy. So don't reduce the number. Same number of bricks, but let's make it a little more challenging. No straw. See, straw was an important component in this time. I did a little looking at this because I'm not a brick maker, but I do know that there are bricks that are fired in heat, and that hardens the clay really well. But it's also time-consuming and expensive. So in this style of brick making, the, the straw was added, and it had chemicals in it that helped to harden the clay three times harder than if there was no clay at all. It also did not require the firing of it, the the heat or the energy or the time. You could mix it up in the right way with the straw, form the bricks, let them dry in the sun, and away you go. So what does Pharaoh do? He says, no way, keep making bricks. And he goes on uh, in the middle of verse 8. Let's just go from verse 8. He says, but the number of bricks that they made in the past you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore, they cry, listen to this, let us go offer sacrifices to our God. Yeah, they keep crying this. I just can hear the sarcasm in Pharaoh's voice. Verse nine, let heavier work be laid on the men that they may labor at it and pay no regards to their lying words. Man, do you hear the the bitterness of Pharaoh's heart? Do you hear the hardness of his heart? Last week, you might recall As Jason was teaching, it says in chapter 4 that that God declared he would harden Pharaoh's heart. And I know that that is a difficult statement for many of you. You're wrestling with, how could God do that? And I want to encourage you again, please get into the, the Word of God. Go and study these things and look and see that you will find the idea of God's sovereignty, that he is all powerful and in control of all things that he is compassionate, that he is the I am, that he has full control. And so you can see the the playing out of the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Verse 10 says, So the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw yourselves wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced in the least. Look at verse 12, it says this, so the people were scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. So you had a workforce and now we've divided your workforce out to go and collect what was provided for you. And it says they had to go scatter all throughout the land. That must have been quite a journey. It wasn't just like, oh, perhaps it's 10 minutes away. This could be a day or two walk to gather and bring back. And you can imagine what it must have been like and the disappointment that was coming onto the Israelites. They went from worship to suffering. Verse 13 says, The taskmasters were urgent, saying, Complete your work your daily task each day as when there was straw. And the foremen of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, why have you not done your task of making bricks today and yesterday as in the past? Man, this is not going the way that I'm sure Moses and Aaron thought it was going to. They go in and they say, let my people go. And and all we see now is more burden, more sorrow, more suffering heaped upon these people. Verse 15 says this, Then the foreman of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, Why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, make bricks. And behold, your servants are beaten. But the fault is your own people. You know those ones that used to give the straw to us? But he said, Pharaoh says this, you are idle, you are idle. That is why you say, let us go sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. No straw will be given to you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. The foreman of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, you shall by no means reduce the number of bricks your daily task each day. Here's this incredible moment. Moses looks on them in their desire to worship, 
to go and seek God. And he says, you're lazy. You're idle. You don't have time to do that. Do you ever hear that in your day? You don't have time to go to church. You don't have time to pray. You don't have time to worship. Get to work. The taskmaster over you says, get to work. You don't have time for God. In fact, you need to work twice as hard. And I'm so glad that our God is a God who desires us to have rest. But that's not the case in our story. In fact, Pharaoh looks at the desire of the people to worship God and declares that they're lazy because they would rest. Declares that they're lazy because they want to take a break from their work. And I hope that you find ways to find rest. I hope that you find ways to worship and ways to step away from the work that is necessary for your week, but also can so easily entangle us and keep us away from worship. But look what happens in verse 20 with me. It says, They met Moses and Aaron, who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. So there's Moses, there's Aaron. He knows that the the leadership who's overseeing the Hebrew workers was in talking to Pharaoh. And it says, as they came out from Pharaoh, verse 21, and they said to them, the Lord look on you and judge because you have made a stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Moses, Aaron, what you said didn't work. You may have said what God said, but it didn't work. In fact, we were worshiping last time we talked. We were worshiping last week, and now we're set at the sword of Pharaoh because of what you said. What are you doing? We stink in the eyes and the nose and the nostrils of Pharaoh. We stink. And I got to tell you, this is one of those moments when you're a leader where you go and you desire to follow God, you say the words of God, you teach the truths of God, and there are those that don't want to follow or those who question what you're doing. And as someone myself, I'm, I'm in unique positions of leadership, and there are days that it's so hard. It's so hard because oftentimes the people that, that you call your people can be so just agitated or they can be so confused or they can be so disappointed because they say you, you preached that message on forgiveness and my neighbor won't forgive me and I can't forgive my neighbor and I'm not finding peace or rest. I just wonder in my own life, how many times have I perhaps not been good to my leadership? Have I let my preferences get in the way or my personality to to impede on what they said God is teaching and his word is true? But I rejected that perhaps. The Lord look on you and judge because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants. But look at verse 22. See, this is an interesting moment. Verse 22, it says, Then Moses turned to the Lord. He didn't say under his breath. He didn't mutter it to Aaron. He turns to the Lord and says, Oh, Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, all he has done to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Why? Have you done this evil? Moses, in this moment of perhaps fear, anger, frustration, looks to the Lord and says, why have you done this evil? You see, God doesn't do evil. He is holy. But Moses here is accusing him. I I think we should remember something. Back at last chapter, this was the same Moses where it said that God's anger was set toward him. And then it said later on that his wife had to help save him from God's destruction over him by circumcising their child because he was not following through on leading his household. And now he's brazen enough to look to God and say, why have you done evil to these people? And then, of course, why did you ever send me? 
Have you ever found yourself like Moses in this position? Why did you send me? Why, why did this happen? How could this be that you would allow this evil in my life? Or you may say, why did you do this evil? And I love God's response. You might recall last week that God didn't respond and coddle Moses or do anything that would say anything to disregard Moses. Instead, he continually points back to who he is. He says, you didn't deliver your people at all. I thought that was the plan. You said, I'm going to give you Moses. You said, I'm going to give you the words to speak. You said that you're going to deliver my people. But it's funny to me because didn't also he say he was going to harden Pharaoh's heart? Isn't it funny how we look at all the things we want out of God and we forget some of the stuff that he also says is going to happen? Like Jesus tells us, you know, if you follow me, if you love me, there's people that are going to hate you because of me. I don't like that. Jesus, I don't like when you say that. I just, want, I just want the love, Jesus. Give me your love. And he says, oh, you've got it. But there's other things that are going to be a part of following me. And I can't help but wonder that. And so I wanted to, to wrestle together with this statement today. It says, God's promises, his timing, and his plan rarely match our desires. You ever felt that way? God, I know your promise. Someday you'll return, you said. But when's that going to happen? Like now would be really good. I would love it if now you would show up. I, I've seen enough of earth. I'm ready. I say this frequently. But in my lack of understanding of God's timing, it's my desire and it ignores the needs of those who don't yet know the Lord. I want the world to end today. God, call me home. I'm ready. Call us home, the church but his timing is different than mine. In fact, I think what you'll find is when you get most upset with God in your life, when you perhaps shake your fist and ask the question, why? At the very root of it, it's because your desire of your timing hasn't been met. Why, God, why did I not get that job promotion this week? You know we needed it. Why didn't I get Notice that word. Why didn't I get this? Why didn't this happen for me? Why, why, why? And we forget about the timing of God, that he's in his perfection, he's working things outside of my understanding. And so my question for you today is, how does your faith handle pain? How does your faith handle pain? When things don't go the way you want, the, the timing that you want, the plan you want, the, the way you think it should happen, and even though it's in line with God's promises, you begin to question, God, where are you? And so today I want to press in with this thought. God is faithful. The hardest part about following God is understanding that his faithfulness is proven over time, not in an instant. We're looking back at Moses' story today, and we can see the faithfulness of God played out. We can see it. We see it before us. But in our life, it's very difficult to see it playing out immediately. In fact, I was at the park, and I was doing some preparation for a message a few, few weeks ago. And I remember I was sitting there all by myself, and God really clearly moved me to this park. And I won't go into the fullness of the story, but two guys showed up. And they walked by and they acknowledged that I had a Bible and they said, oh, you're reading the Bible and what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm preparing to, you know, to preach God's word. And oh, that's great. And they went on their way and they made their way back. And one of the guys sat down and started talking to me. It was a cool moment. I believe God's hand was all over this conversation. But his opening phrase was, I can't wait until I get to be face to face with God and have a heart to heart and ask him, why are you doing this? Because he was living in his car at the time. I want to shake my fist at God and tell him and ask him questions. And we're going to straighten some stuff out someday. And I honestly, it's hard not to giggle because I think, do you recognize who you're talking to? God is faithful, but he's also not a God that, that can be manipulated. The, the Egyptians had all kinds of gods they, they would worship and do rituals to. There was this one God, the sun God, Ra. 
And he was, could be manipulated to, to bring life or healing, perhaps. And that is not our God. He is faithful. He continues who he is, who he was, who he will be, and he is unchangeable. He is faithful to his promises. If he says it's going to happen, it will happen. We have to understand, though, it happens in his timing, not ours. Let's take a look at chapter 6 now and look at what happens. Instead of God talking to Moses and saying what I would probably say is, Moses, sit down. I got things to say to you. He doesn't do that. Our gracious, compassionate God says this, verse six, or chapter 6, verse 1. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. God spoke to Moses and said, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. Moses, you've got a unique opportunity. I presented my name to you. I have told you who I am. They didn't even know this information. Verse 4, I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groanings of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. I haven't forgotten. Verse 6, Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Let's just pause. There's a powerful moment, and in your notes today, I left some blanks for you. I'd love for you to write these down. Let's just take a look and go back for a moment. Let's comb through this. Look at the statements that God is telling Moses, and he says, tell this to the Israelites. Pass this on. This is important information. Look what he says in verse 6. Therefore, say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. He starts there. Tell them I'm the Lord. Remember who I am. And I will bring you. I will bring you out. It will be me who will do this work. You will be a part of it, but it is me. He says, I will deliver you from slavery. You will find freedom because of me. I will redeem you. I will restore you and redeem you with an outstretched arm. My power will be on full display. Verse 7, he says, I will take you to be my people. This is a God of relationship, of sincere desire to be in communion with him. He says, I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. This is a, a personal God. I am yours and you are mine, and we are together as, as a family. See, I see you for the value of who you are. I am not a God who's easily manipulated. I am not movable. I am unshakable. You cannot manipulate me, and I want to be fully available to you, though. And verse 80 says, I will bring you into the land. Not I will send you, not I will point the way. He says, I will bring you. I'm, this is a relationship statement. I will bring you with me into the land that I soar. And finally, I love this. I will give it to you. Our God is so generous. I'm going to give you this land. There's nothing you're going to have to do for it. I'm going to pave the way for you, so to speak. I'm going to present it all to you. See, our God is faithful. And in this moment, Moses is going to go and he's going to tell the Israelites, he's going to read all the things that we just covered. And look what happens in verse 9. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. This must have been such a gut punch. 
Once again, you're in the presence of God. You're in worship. You're experiencing the movement of God in your life, and you go to share that with your people. And once again, they will not listen. And it was so crushing. You can see in a moment how Moses responds to this. But let's go back and ask the question again. Where, or excuse me, how does your faith handle pain? Pastor Jason was sharing that question with me. How does your faith handle pain? Where do you turn when things break your spirit? When you feel the harshness of the difficulty around you, where do you turn? Do you turn to a faithful God? Or do you create other ways like turn to money or turn to sex, turn to alcohol? Where do you turn? I want us to keep in the forefront that God is faithful as we finish up today. Verse 10 says this, So the Lord said to Moses, Go in. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of this, his land. But Moses said to the Lord, behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. God, they're not listening. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. Listen, your people won't listen to me. How would this guy who already claims he doesn't know you even listen to me? And I, this phrase is so interesting. He says, I am of uncircumcised lips. Here's the, the basic idea of that. I don't have the speech ability to speak your words accurately, God. Apparently, I am failing I'm not doing something right. I'm not uttering something correctly. I'm not pronouncing it in the right order. Whatever I'm not doing is not enough. And God is going to continue to say, I've got the ball here. In fact, I want to press on something. There is a cultural statement out there. This cultural statement says that God will never give you more than you can handle. So they've taken some scripture that talked about temptation and they've applied it in a different way. And that is not true. In fact, God says, I am the only one who can handle it. So there's going to be a lot you can't handle, but when I'm with you, I will handle it because I'm faithful. Will you trust me enough to let me handle it with you though? Because if our God wouldn't give us, would only give us what we could handle, then maybe we should ask the question, why would we even need God if we can handle it? I just encourage you to wrestle with that thought a little bit. He says he had uncircumcised lips. He was unable to speak God's word perfectly. You're going to look through scripture and you're going to hear two other times that this idea of circumcision is used in a way that refers to our heart, uncircumcised hearts, and also uncircumcised ears. And I just want to ask you to make sure that you're evaluating first your heart. Is your heart hard toward God like Pharaoh? That's an uncircumcised heart. I, I really don't want to trust you. I've heard a lot of things about you, but I don't really want to trust you. And, and of course, the ears, I'm resistant to your truth. My uncircumcised ears say, I'm resistant to your truth. I just don't really like what you have to say, because honestly, it means that I have to surrender to you, and I'm not sure I want that. So do you ever feel like you have an uncircumcised heart or ears or like Moses? Your lips cannot speak God's word the way that you think it should. And I just want to encourage you that when God is the, the Lord of your life, when you've surrendered fully to him, he will guide you. He will soften your heart if you'll allow him. He will give you truth in your ears if you will open up to him, and he will give you the words to say if you will surrender to him. But Moses says, I am of uncircumcised lips, verse 13. But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. As we close today, I want you to go away from this message asking some important questions. I started with this idea, why God? And if you're wrestling with the why of God today, I, I want to encourage you to do some evaluation of where is your faith? And do you trust our faithful God? So I'm going to release to our campuses, and I want to encourage you to, to enjoy celebrating God's powerful word in our lives. Thank you, guys. See you soon.
So you've stuck around with me for the end, and I'm so grateful. I hope that as as we walk through God's Word, that that you're able to wrestle well with the challenge today. And so my my invitation of you is this. I've in the notes you might find it says to look up each of the promises from Jesus this week. Let's apply Scripture to us. We've been talking a lot about the Israelites today, and it still applies to us. But Jesus today speaks truths to you through His Word, and so go look up His. The, there's seven uh, statements that Jesus makes. I want to encourage you to go look at that, and then evaluate those statements in your life, where do you struggle to trust that Jesus is faithful? Where do you struggle? And then, of course, celebrate where is your faith growing? Because you may find there are some statements that a few years ago, a few weeks ago, yesterday, you're like, I don't know that I can believe that. And today you can say, yes, I do believe this. And I thank you, Jesus, that you are a God that I can trust because you are faithful. I'm so glad you could join me today. I hope you'll take this challenge and spend a few minutes. First of all, look up the scriptures. I encourage you to look them up and write down what Jesus says. And then I would encourage you to spend some time throughout the week evaluating your life. Don't just let this be a two-minute exercise. Let this be something that, that kind of seasons your week as you look at who Jesus is, and every time you interact with other people, every time you're tempted to ask why, ask yourself a deeper question. What is it you're trying to show me today, God? I love you guys. Let me pray for you. Father God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for your truth. We ask, God, that you would do an immeasurable work in us. I pray for anyone who's hearing this today that does not yet know you. God, that they would soften their hearts towards you. They would open their ears to receive your word, that that they would be willing to speak the simple truth, I surrender to you, Jesus, today. And if you today already know Jesus, I, God, we thank you. Thank you that you would give us life. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next week.